Hello everybody, uh, welcome to this same webinar on knowing when ecological, ecological reports are fit for purpose. Um, I'm just going to cover a few bits of housekeeping before I hand over to Sally Haynes, who is the CEO of Sayim. Um, so just to note, we'll be having a Q&A session at the end of the webinar. So please do pop your questions into the Q&A box and we will look to answer those at the end. Uh, we will also be having a few polls, so please do take part on those when they appear on your screen. And also please do use the chat uh, box for any, any information that you'd like to share with everybody. Uh, so without further ado, I will hand over to Sally to officially open the webinar. Thank you, Sally. Thank you very much, Christy. Um, I'm going to assume you can hear me okay unless something you tell me otherwise. So thank you everybody for uh, joining this uh, webinar and welcome to the third and final webinar in our series of three under the banner title, Understanding Biodiversity in the Planning System. So this series of webinars has been created specifically for planners and planning committee members, i.e. those charged with ensuring that biodiversity is protected and enhanced within the development planning system. Thriving biodiversity or nature is fundamental to human health and well-being and is rightly protected by legislation and policy. We're aware that a number of you attending the webinar aren't planners and that's absolutely fine, but just please bear in mind that the content is particularly around the planning perspective um, of the biodiversity legislation and policy. This is because planners have a critically important role in the implementation of that legislation and policy designed to protect and enhance biodiversity. Planners, you are the checks and balances that ensure the law is not broken and that policies designed to prevent further loss of biodiversity are, are adhered to and that development can be designed in such a way that biodiversity thrives. So the topic of this webinar, which is knowing when ecological reports are fit for purpose, is therefore critically important in helping you to fulfill this role. This webinar is being presented by Alan Evans of the Environmental Partnership. So over to you, Alan. Right, thank you, Sally. And uh, good morning, just about good afternoon all. Um, as Sally says, we appreciate that um, some attending today will be in planning, working for local planning authorities, but other people that may be consultants or graduates, students, and that hopefully give them an insight into what people will be reviewing, or what they, how they will be reviewing these reports when they're submitted in support of planning applications. So he says this is knowing about when ecological reports are fit for purpose. Things we'll hope to cover are the sort of competence of people who are undertaking surveys and uh, preparing these reports, tools such as uh, the ecological impact assessment checklist would be useful for all when both preparing and reviewing reports, quick run through of when surveys should have been done uh, to include within the reports, whether this information is proportional, any limitations to the surveys that should be flagged up in the reports that can have implications for whether all impacts of the proposed development have been fully assessed, whether the, the mitigation and the compensation measures are proposed, um, proportionate and appropriate, or thinking ahead of how we're going to secure anything within these ecological reports with the mitigation compensation, and finding what well, if we still haven't resolved our issues with issues flagged up in the report, how do we sort of get these four reports um, reconsidered or get them re reissued. So giving a bit of a, a context really, obviously throughout UK and Ireland there's a very high volume of planning applications that are submitted uh, to support development. Um, one quarter of that I've, information I found was uh, between October and, October and December 2019, uh, over 100,000 planning applications were made just for district level uh, planning authority in England alone. So I've done a rough calculation. I think that probably equates to something like 10,000 ecological reports just in England, which roughly works out to what I used to deal with when I worked in local authorities, really, which used to be sort of like 200 consultations every sort of quarter, really. Also worth noting that not all planning authorities do have access to specialist ecological advice. Um, the last sort of survey, 2013 by the Association of Local Government Ecologists identified that only a third of local planning authorities in England had direct access. 
Uh, hopefully things have changed and moved on a bit from then. Um, obviously increased legislation, biodiversity net gains, so hopefully uh, more authorities are now perhaps appointing uh, specialist ecologists. Certainly, uh, you know, if you look at the vacancies in the last sort of, 12 months, there have been more opportunities for those who want to enter local government, local government ecologist. At the same time, there has been a reduction in the sort of the support from some of the statutory agencies. Obviously, they're focusing their efforts on usually now the statutory sites and have limited time to actually provide detailed responses to sort of smaller scale developments and protected species in some circumstances. Ecology reports, well, as so the high volume of them produced, but are they all fit for purpose? And this was an interesting study that was done by Tim Reed, who reviewed 33 ecological reports that have been submitted uh, for planning. Some, but not all, were done by SAE members. And he picked up that only 6% actually provided detailed methods of how the surveys have been done. 15% probably no details on methodology. And 79% failed to provide any clear method at all, which is slightly concerning, really. Um, and 45% failed to recognize any limitations whatsoever in the reports. Um, they, some, usually, there are one or two limitations to any survey. Uh, I'm not saying they ever have any, but um, it's a very high number. Um, I mean, th these reports shouldn't perhaps be as bad as that, pay that uh, survey found, really, because there's a lot of guidance out there for, for members and non members of SIEM. So, in 2017, guidelines were produced on how to write ecological reports cover the types of reports, provide advice, even a checklist on what to include. And more recently, both SIEM, together with the Association of Local Government Ecologists, provided a very useful and detailed checklist for ecological impact assessment type reports, um, which is primarily aimed at consultants in the first place, so you can you know, QA and check their own report. I think it's also being used by one or two local authorities. But it's a useful checklist that anyone in planning could use as a quick resume when looking at reports to say, have all the issues been covered? Have impacts on protected sites been considered? Have compensation measures been included? Have biodiversity enhancement measures been identified? So I would certainly refer you to this, and it's obviously freely available on the website. Turning to survey reports themselves, there are some very sort of basic um, pointers that are also very useful. Uh, fundamental, which does the survey report actually cover the correct red line boundary that's um, been submitted with the application? Plans do change, and that you know sometimes the ecological consultant hasn't been told of the latest, latest version, therefore is working on a slightly different geographic area. Than the, the final red line that's submitted. So um, these things can happen. So there always needs to be good dialogue um, between the ecologist and the client and the other specialists, especially when it comes to things like bat mitigation. You know, there should be a good dialogue between you know, what being a householder type application, farm conversions. There should be a good dialogue between the architect involved and the ecologist to ensure all the bat mitigations are included in the architect's plans. And often when I worked in the local authority, it used to be a case of do the tree surveys being submitted, identifying all the relevant trees and their condition, does that align with the ecological survey? Because you can get circumstances where um, the college assumes that tree is staying and therefore there's no impact on bats. However, the ARB report says no, the trees are unfit to remain in that condition, potentially due to uh, issues it's in a public realm area and it's not safe to retain it. So these things need to be lined up. And then in more detail, you know, perhaps this is where your apologist or ecological advisor would, would review it in detail. You know, if you've got a number of buildings, such as the plan here, have a relevant number of surveyors being, pro being provided for that survey to ensure they've got all the potential roost points and access points to the barns or buildings covered. So again, just a few little pointers there, things to quickly run through a little bit of a check to ensure that this report is, is on track and the Will be deemed acceptable. Obviously, 
the reports or the surveys in the first place and then the reports should be undertaken by people who are obviously qualified and experienced they should have good knowledge of both biodiversity legislation and planning you know, ideally be a membership of a professional body such as SAIM and they should adhere to the biodiversity code of practice of planning and development which really aims to promote transparency and consistency in the quality and appropriate content of ecological information submitted and there is a little smart guide on this you can uh, download and understand um, unfortunately not all ecological surveys are submitted by ecologists i'm aware of at least one case where an architect claimed to be an ecologist and uh, tried to do an ecological survey which wasn't um, overly successful should we say i mean when you are looking at specialist um, species such as otter here on the river you know you need someone who's got that eye in and knowledge of know that that little bit of bear bank a little river cliff is going to have some otter spray potentially on it i see on the lower picture that's a pound coin for size so you know you do need a, a specialist ecology who's got the eye and knowledge if you're looking for things which are minute detail you know if you're looking for water bowl droppings the size of a tic tac and then if you're starting to look for uh yeah back droppings the size of a mouse or a grain of rice then uh yeah you really need to know what you're doing obviously you know uh, it's a free market and um developers can choose who they wish to use as ecologists and uh, i think some local planning authorities do have lists but also they usually say this is isn't an indication of competence, it's just that people have said, can you add us to the list, um, work locally. Um, it doesn't mean that you know, that's a sort of endorsement of their capability. Obviously, for, for planners who work in you know, a borough or a local authority area for a number of years, they'll see reports by usually a fairly small number of usual suspects and ecologists, and they'll know that over time, that, uh, that which ones are good, which ones are perhaps less so, and the good ones will now have a high degree of confidence in what's being included in that report is usually fit for purpose. And it can be beneficial if the ecological consultant preparing the report is local to the area, because obviously they've got specialist knowledge on the habitats and species found in their local area, which can be particularly valuable. And obviously the framework for ecology, both set out in legislation, also in terms of the planning is set out in standing advice which is provided by the uh, statutory agencies in scotland northern ireland and england and wales is what they call it guidance um, but this does detail both sort of legislation potential impacts and the surveys methodology and times that when they should be undertaken really so a bit of a poll now i'm just uh, interested to know how many you are aware of um, the standing advice issued by the statutory agencies so hopefully you can answer that question and with most things it's um online for each of the different agencies be it nature scott they are now in scotland Well, that's a good, good response. At least 72% uh, are aware of it. So that's a very good uptake. Um, it is fairly consistent across the different countries, and what's included. Um, and interestingly, slight differences in places depending on different species. So uh, I'm happy that uh, we are all at least looking at that. And then with particular species, obviously, there's different skills required. You know, if you're doing a botanical survey, obviously you need to have very good plant identification. If you're moving to, to animals, obviously then you need to know about their ecology, their habits, field science, etc. And then you do need a range of different skills if, depending on the site and the uh, receptors you're going to find. And there is again standard guidance of how the survey should be undertaken, who should be carry out these, you know, such as the Bat Conservation Trust, Bat Surveys for Ecologists. Uh, which does set out you know, in detail how surveys should be undertaken and who by. And some of these surveys can uh, obviously be undertaken by those with licenses, you know, certainly for the European protected species, such as breakers, newts, and bats. Uh, you will need a survey license uh, to undertake such surveys, and these issued by you know, nature conservation organisations.
organisations, be it you know, Natural England, NLW in Wales, Legioscopic, etc. And again, to get a licence, uh, you need to prove you've got relevant experience and also include references. So when these issues are licensed, you know, the person should already have sufficient experience and be deemed you know, competent to undertake surveys on their own. Obviously, hopefully most reports are actually undertaken during the uh, appropriate time of year. Of the extended phase ones can be undertaken throughout the year. Uh, although once you get into sort of October through to March, you know, that's winter months can be suboptimal, uh, you know, obviously because a lot of vegetation dies back and it's not as easy to identify the full range of plants that may be found. Other surveys, particularly for protected species, you know, that have a more limited window, you know, so trying to look for grass snakes in um, December would be inappropriate. Uh, they're obviously in hibernation and shouldn't be going disturbing uh, hibernating species. Now here's just a, a general um, overview of what would be deemed an appropriate season for protected species. Um, badgers are obviously generally more active uh, between February and November. Obviously you can still find sets in winter and sometimes uh, going into wood and scrub in winter is like, you know, easier due to the dieback of vegetation. Uh, I'm sure anyone who works in consultancy will uh, pass on the message that, uh, yeah, I've ripped that jacket thousand times trying to crawl through brambles looking for badger sets. Um, other species, such as bats, also you can look, they've got hibernation roosts in barns, obviously you can do those in winter. But if you want activity surveys, obviously you've got a limited window of May to mid September, which is now obviously just coming to the end. Similarly for foraging, really. So the whole range of you know surveys when they should be undertaken and the windows there. Obviously, the local planning authority does require all the survey information uh, with necessary to make its planning decision in light of its legal duties and planning policies. Um, but it can only really ask for the information that's um, relevant, necessary uh, to the application, um, so, and that's specified certainly in England in the MPPF. It's also about what is the, the risk to biodiversity and the nature and scale of rose development. Obviously, if you've got some uh, amenity grassland um, in an urban area, obviously it's a fairly low ecological value. And you know, so that went for housing. So the risk to any impacts on nature are fairly low as well, really. So it's all about the, uh, the scale of risk and impact. The habitat in question, obviously, if we have a load of woodland here or nice Lowland heath and obviously the scale of impacts, the consideration would be far greater. And hopefully, you know, if pre application advice has been undertaken, the scope of surveys have already been agreed with the local planning authority, and that's may should be included within the report. Sometimes, um, certainly, if people have been to the statutory agency and got um, discretion advice um, service, then they often include uh, feedback from the statutory agency. And sometimes um, colleges also include any sort of discussions they've had with local planning and colleges to degree scope of surveys as well. Um, other times, obviously, during the extended phase one survey or initial walkover, um, ecological consultants may scope features in or out for requiring further surveys. It's all about being proportionate to the risks and to the scale of the development. Another crucial point that uh, is often brought up in the review in reports that are submitted. Well, is this data still up to date? Um, obviously, you know, people did a survey a few years ago, but for whatever reason, the development haven't gone forward and haven't submitted the planning application. Some of these reports can uh, sit around in people's folders. And by the time they finally get around to submitting the application, they think, oh, I've got one of those and submit it. But, you know, time does march on, things do change. It, Things can change in terms of legislation or process. You know, we've seen the last sort of 12, 18 months in England, district level licensing, that wasn't around previously, that's a new approach. But even the original data does need to be up to date. Generally, anything less than 12 months old, you know, that's going to be valid in most cases. Once you get into sort of 12 to 18 months, things can change. You need first for mobile species such as bats and badgers, um, so that 
if you think those species are uh, a consideration in the application, then maybe looking for you know, an update if um, the report is certainly getting towards 18 months old. Anything beyond 18 months to three years, well, yeah, but sites should at least get a site walkover, I think, just to confirm that the situation hasn't changed on the ground. I've got a colleague now who um, I think she did a report about 18 months ago for someone and uh, just found out that um, a load of soil has been now dumped across the entire site from an adjacent development. So, um, yeah, that site has certainly changed um, from being grassland to now bare soil. So, yeah, she's going to do a walkover to just uh, check anything else hasn't changed as well. Uh, going back to a point that um, I raised in the beginning about limitations and something that, that, that study by Tim Reed. Uh, there are limitations to most surveys and these should be flagged up in reports. Sometimes um, the resources, especially equipment, can fail. Um, due for whatever factors which sometimes are outside the control. Uh, well, for the wind farm uh, development and they had uh, they were monitoring bats at the turbine tip and uh, everyone was unaware of the impacts of salt. It was uh, in the, near an estuary and uh, some of the bat detectives actually stopped working because the salt impacts on the electronics. So things can happen like that. Um, and where people have been asked to go out in midwinter um, due to time constraints, again, that should be flagged up. And if there's any issues, I think, well, this is, you know, suboptimal time of year. Um, we think we've got some interesting grass in here, so therefore we should be going back to do a you know, follow-up survey in June. Um, as, although there are good practice guidelines, you know, as I mentioned, for Bat Conservation Trust, the English Nature Great Christian Mitigation Guidelines, sometimes there are alternative approaches that are adopted. Um, so where you know, colleges are deviating from these good practice guidelines, again, they should identify that and just provide justification for it. Um, other limitation that can happen, adverse weather conditions, um, even in August uh, this year, you know, not so long ago, uh, we were due to go do a waterfall survey in North North Wales. Uh, Storm Francis rolled in and uh, led to the the river rising by about a metre and a half in less than 12 hours. So that clearly was going to be a major impact on any survey we were going to do. So we decided to not go ahead with that and uh, delay it by two weeks to let river levels um, return to, to normal. Other issues can be restricted access to part of a site, either due to buildings unsafe, presence of asbestos, or just physically can't get in. And I mentioned you know, the scrub and bramble it is difficult to, to crawl your way into certain parts of sites. And sometimes there can be um, third party interference with uh, remote sensing techniques. Uh, certainly, colleagues I've known who've used um, trail cameras, such as the one on the right here, left them securely, you know, locked to. Uh, what they thought were immovable barriers, etc. Uh, they've gone back to collect the detector and uh, it has disappeared. So these things do go on and uh, can have an effect on results and what appears as results in the report. Also, you haven't done all the surveys, then the report should really be identifying what are these, you know, the impacts on the uh, sort of ecological re receptors and the effects. Also, they should again be starting off with the uh, mitigation hierarchy, so you should be avoiding impacts in the first place. Where that can't be uh, included, then to mitigate or compensate. Uh, these impacts should be obviously identified. And going back to the original point that you know, are the proposed development plans the latest ones, so the, the ecological impacts are duly considered. It was important. But uh, usually there will be some sort of impact on ecological receptors, and therefore, there, you know, if the harm can't be avoided, then mitigation compensation will be required. And in the report, you know, these should be appropriate, clearly stated, proportionate, deliverable, and uh, if you're a planner, obviously you need to be thinking, can they be secured either through planning condition or legal agreement? And once you get into these mitigation and compensation, Compensation measures also you do need that input of the LPA ecologist with appointed advisor. Uh, 
obviously a lot of developments usually involve some loss of vegetation. Um, I'm sure many of you have been aware of you know, lots of small areas of scrub and trees and value for nesting birds. Uh, be interested to know now another little poll. Um, how many think the below statement is a, a fair statement to make that to compensate for the loss of bird nesting uh, habitat, bird boxes could be erected on the retaining trees? So, how many do you think this could be an appropriate statement? Wait for those results to uh, come through. Take a bit of time, apologies for that. So 33% uh, of you, so yes, that's appropriate. 49% uh, of you, which is uh, the greater factor, say no. And they've got 18% not sure. Um, I think it's a fair statement, however, it's not overly detailed or precise really. Um, a, we don't know how many bird boxes um, or where they're going to go, and the word could isn't it, uh, fairly definitive, it's not really a commitment. Um, so in a report, things should be better. Um, so um, hopefully you can now see uh, a second statement, again regarding this loss of uh, nesting habitat. So to compensate for the loss of bird, bird nesting habitat, five bird boxes, two times model A and three times model B, will be erected on retained trees on the western boundary as identified on plan 1.1. So again, a bit of a poll. How many think this is an appropriate statement to include in the cultural report? Wait for the results to come through. Yeah, there we are. 92% think that you this is a private statement. Yeah, it's far more precise. We know exactly what's being diluted and where. And from a planner's perspective, that's very useful if they're going to consider to formulate some uh, planning condition around it, really. Obviously, we are seeing suggestions for compensation and mitigation measures in the report. Um, can they actually be incorporated? Going back to the point about architects' plans and bat roosts, you know, very important, obviously. But uh, even basic things like, are there suitable trees to install bird and bat boxes on? Um, I'm aware of at least one site where um, bird boxes were proposed, but there weren't actually any trees to install them on. Um, so yeah, if you have trees like the ones in the right there, recently planted, um, you know, they're about four or five meters high, and they're not gonna support a bird box, are they? So uh, yeah. And it's all about engagement with um, architects, etc., to ensure ecological features are being incorporated. So, we also need to think about whether what's being proposed as compensation is proportionate. Um, obviously, things have advanced a lot recently in certain England biodiversity net gain, which we won't get into detail here, but you know, we should be looking like for like for habitat replacement and the amount of habitat being created be equal to or greater than that's being lost ideally and generally sort of presumption you know presumptions um if there are impacts on species you know so we have a loss of low numbers of pipistrels you know so five pipistrels have been found roosting in the barn or buildings going to be demolished um you could you know think oh do you need a bat barn here or will bat boxes suffice and i think uh, in this case the loss of you know small roost of Pipistrels, bat boxes would be uh, more than adequate to deal with that, that impact, really. Um, similarly, if we if a great question newts, now this is uh, uh, taken from a bit of a an application that I was aware of, where they were proposing, I think, with seven houses on a hectare of land, uh, there was a pond in one corner, and all the terrestrial land uh, to the north, where other ponds were as well, and um, Basically, they're going to lose 91% of the 
of the great crested new terrestrial habitat on the site. And the only compensation was a four metre wide uh, linear habitat corridor being proposed. Uh, interested to know whether you think that's uh, acceptable, um, that level of compensation. Again, so a bit of a poll should be coming out. Wait for those results to come through. Yep. So the vast majority, eighty-six percent, say that that's not that, that's not suitable. And interestingly, the the council in that case also thought, yep, that's definitely not right, and they refused the application for those seven houses. Um, I think the applicant took appeal, and the uh, planning inspector agreed with the council. And one of the reasons for refusing or dismissing the appeal was the impact on Great Christian Utes, uh, even in the uh, Planning inspector's report. He also uh, found it interesting that the uh, Great Christian Youth were expected to do a dog leg around the uh, side of the site to get to a newly created pond as well. It's quite an interesting site there. Uh, but of googling over the weekend, I found that subsequently that site um, they resubmitted an application, reducing the number of houses down to four, and they were retain 25% of the habitat on site. And uh, the council then issued a permission on that basis. So um, yeah, they were. Now simply incorporate compensation loss of habitat. It's also worth thinking ahead about what's in the report. You know, can it actually be delivered, and where they're going to be delivered. Uh, usually, in most cases, the measures uh, should be on land under the applicant's control. Although sometimes it has to be off site due to the scale of development. Other features that need to be created in advance of the actual development. So, you know, if we're going to lose some ponds on site, general premise, best practice, create ponds in advance. So, again, um, is that identified in the report? Are there opportunities to do so? And some of these compensation um, measures, such as pond creation, actually might need a separate planning application in the first place, or a bat barn, especially if it's on, on additional land or outside the uh, applicant's control. So, again, things to think about. And, even if we're trying to dig a pond, you know, has the um, ecologist thought about, well, is the, the, the land suitable for creating a pond? There's no, it may be far more difficult to create a pond on a you know, sandy substrate with fruity draining. It's not going to hold water as opposed to, you know, some nice um, clay soil. Where you know, there's a high chance of water retention, really. So uh, important to consider environmental factors. And similarly, if you're trying to create some Species rich grass, and if the, if the land's been uh, in intensive arable production for the last 50 years, then it's going to have high nutrient content, and therefore, you know, even though you might prepare the soil, there's going to be a residual uh, nutrient content of that soil that might lead to weeds overtaking the seed you've created. So, it needs to be considered. Um, some authorities, this is an example from Dorset, you know almost provide a checklist approach to whether the mitigation compensation is being clearly laid out in the report, can clearly be identified down to the you know, types of bat box, number, the position, um, and then Dorsey actually, they charge a fee for issuing like a separate report to run alongside the planning application. So yeah, they're happy that everything's been considered and to provide that confidence to the planner, the, the, this is fit for purpose. But we're looking at that example in Dorset County Council. And if people are dealing with sites with European protected species, obviously that sort of raises the stakes somewhat. Because obviously the local planning authority needs to consider the three tests, especially in terms of ecology, um, whether the species population will be maintained at favourable conservation status in its natural range. Um, and again, this should be identified in the report. Um, not all ecological consultants do do this. Um, it's beneficial because it does help the local planning authority ecologists to so we can do the job for them. And you know, if there are impacts requiring a license, again, from English Nature, so Natural England, I should say, NRW, um, 
the need for that license should be clearly identified. Obviously, it's probably more for planners in the audience today than um, consultants or, or those who are just getting into the industry. But we do need to work out how we're going to secure the mitigation or compensation measures. Obviously, you know, there are set uh, almost controls around when and how planning conditions can be issued. In England, they set out in paragraph 5 of the National Planning Policy Framework. Setting out that planning conditions should be necessary, relevant to planning, relevant to the development permitted, enforceable, precise, and reasonable in all other respects, really. So I'm sure this applies throughout the UK and Ireland when the planners are putting conditions on. Definitely they need these tests. So hopefully, I've drafted a suitably worded condition here. Uh, the development should be undertaken in accordance with the mitigation and compensation measures, paragraph. 5.1 to 5.7, with the with the ecological assessment of the Long Lane Farm, the shires. So we identify there are impacts, uh, there are mitigation and compensation measures, uh, they're sort of relevant to planning, and we clearly secure those, we've identified them through this condition. But the time is obviously which that um, the implications and the compensation is perhaps far greater but can't be dealt with by condition and the formal legal or planning agreement needs to be agreed again with tests around this need to serve a planning purpose related to proposed development be related to scale and kind of the development proposed and satisfy the test of reasonableness and these sort of things probably aren't included in the ecological reports but for, for planners who are dealing with applications these will be in their back of their minds thinking yeah we need to secure the measures uh, through a legal agreement. And things like uh, biodiversity measured off site or financial contributions to third parties, be they the Barnell Group or other NGOs, or in some cases, the provision of land to create nature reserves. These are areas that will sort of be secured through sort of planning or Section 106 legal agreements. So what happens then if you do find yourself um, having reviewed a report, decide this isn't quite right here, surveys aren't up to scratch, it's perhaps inconsistencies with the plan submitted, um, not quite clear on what's been proposed in terms of compensation or mitigation and where it's been delivered. Obviously the first real thing is to go back and ask for clarification, you know, to ask for further information amendments and um, Certainly, when I worked as a local planning ecologist, that's what we used to do in most cases. You know, we usually resolve many things by, by dialogue, uh, getting reports updated or plans amended to make sure they're, they're acceptable, really. Clearly, there can be circumstances where, um, whatever in the client decides he doesn't want to uh, get the reports amended or change his plans, and sometimes he refuses to provide that additional information, and that could be a a reason to refuse an application if uh, insufficient information is provided. Um, if you think that the ecological consultant has written a report, prepared it, you know, has done a particularly uh, inappropriate job uh, and is not acting, you know, in accordance with uh, best practice, uh, advising the client on matters which are outside their scope. Then, you know, certainly for members of SAIME, there, there is a whole professional conduct process where people uh, are reported in effect, uh, sometimes by local government colleges, sometimes by their own clients, to say that I'm not happy with this work. And then um, that those reports are assessed and um, advice given, or, you know, in the worst case, um, they, they can be. Um, their membership can be taken away. So there are options out there. Hopefully you never get to that, that, that last element of um, getting people sort of almost struck off. We don't want to be there. Advice is usually appropriate, but uh, if we do the dialogue in the first place to get those clarification and information provided, in most cases, uh, things can be resolved. Um, 
I think in, gym, in most cases, it's usually the case. So that's a, a quick go through of what to consider in terms of the reports submitted and what's before you. Uh, it is important to review and be aware of the range of advice and guidance out there, be it stunning advice. If you are fortunate enough, if you're a planner, you have got a colleague of the local planning anthropologist or utilize um, external people and you've got that advice to bring them on board, say, to you know, give those reports a thorough review. At the end of the day, there will be third parties who are perhaps not always uh, happy with developments in their backyard, should we say, and there is a risk of judicial review if the report's on top of scratch and you haven't followed due process. So it is very important to get that local planning authority input. And I would finally, um, point again to this ecological impact assessment checklist. Although, again, it was aimed primarily at ecological consultants right reports, I think it's a very good checklist for those working in planning authorities to quickly use just pointers to consider when reports are before them and issues to consider. So that's the end of, um, for me for now, um, over to questions really, we've got about 20 minutes. Okay, thank you very much, Alan. Uh, Christy, if you can turn my video on, that would be great. Thank you. Uh, uh, lovely. Right, we have got a few uh, questions, Alan. I'll try and um, uh, work through them. A very straightforward one to start with from Catherine Dew. Do you have the appeal number for the GCN Habitat Loss Appeal? Um, I, if you can sort that I out. I do have it, and uh, I, can, I can forward it on. Bye. That'd be great, thank you. Yep. I'm gonna make sure uh, Catherine gets that. Uh, thank you. Um, then, um, Marag Wilson says, um, in terms of the age of data, I guess the longevity of ecological reports, any guidance on, on the, in this COVID age? Um, I'll let you try that one, Alan, and then I might add something uh, afterwards. Yes, obviously, um... COVID in the last six, nine months has been an issue uh, for ecology and all uh, people working in, in planning and development. And um, I think there certainly has been advice issued by some of the statutory agencies on the age of survey data. Certainly uh, Natural Resources Wales did issue um, a statement fairly early on in terms of recognizing that people can't go out and do surveys uh, as they would normally. And therefore, I can't remember what the threshold they provided with the two years old, I think, to be protected species, they would accept as a reasonable age of data. Um, I think Natural England also did then issue something, Sally, I don't know if you can recall that. Yeah, I think that's a sort of slightly unofficial uh, policy on that. What I would say is that in the um, guidance that SIGN published on um, uh, sort of alternative approaches to ecological survey and assessment during the, the this COVID period, which is temporary guidance. It's not meant to replace the, the more permanent guidance. Uh, for the different taxa that were covered, I think there were a number of suggestions about um, um, uh, how you um, uh, might use survey data that is, that is a bit older than, than would normally uh, be the case and how you might tackle some of, the, some of those issues. That, that uh, guidance document is available, freely available to download on the SIGN COVID-19 uh, web pages. So anybody can download that, but certainly for the different tax. So there, was, there were slightly different approaches being uh, proposed, um, but um, in some cases um, there was uh, potentially, uh, we're certainly aware of some local planning authorities that might have um, conditioned further surveys where they would not normally have done so. Um, so, um, so different approaches being taken, but there is some some guidance out there. Yeah. I would also suggest that you speak to, or at least drop a, an email to the local planning authority ecologist to state what your proposed methodology is, if it's deviating away from standard guidance, and to get that dialogue with them. And hopefully they're amenable to, you know, given the circumstances. And if you've got that in writing, that confirmation, then you know, when you do eventually submit your report, uh, with the planning application, then they shouldn't come with a shock to that apologist or the planning authority that you know, alternative methods have 
been employed. So get that dialogue going. And I think that's good advice, you know, with anything where you're, you're deviating significantly from, from guidance. Guidance is guidance, so um, uh, they're not rules. But uh, obviously you need to be, from the ecolog ecological consultant's point of view, you need to be able to justify why you're doing something differently. And for the, uh, the planner, it's best not to have surprises when things turn up and try and work out why something has been done differently. So we would certainly uh, recommend um, dialogue with the um, uh, planner uh, as early as possible. Um, and just something else, just before I lose it out of my head, right at the start, Alan, you were talking about um, ecological reports being submitted sometimes by people other than uh, maybe the, the, the consultant or, or, the, or the client, maybe by the architect or planner. I uh, would strongly recommend um, that everybody make sure in the ecological reports it's very clear what the report is, and what the purpose of the report is. We've certainly had instances where members' uh, reports, maybe a scoping report, maybe a walkover survey, has without their knowledge then been submitted in support of a, uh, a planning application um, uh, as an impact assessment effectively and been pulled to pieces um, but it was never intended to be what it was then submitted to the planner, planning authority for. So always make sure that the purpose of the report um, is, is clear. Um, but moving on to another question, um, uh, uh, an anonymous attendee has asked, um, could we discuss establishment prior to planning permis permission or damage in respect of mechanisms and consents as there's a tension here? But this came in quite early, so I don't know if it was covered by some of your um, uh, later um, discussion, Alan, and if I'm honest, I'm not sure I completely yeah. understand. So we're talking about here um, yeah. works to sites in advance of planning applications, I take it. Yeah, but, um, uh, essentially, yeah. Yeah, so obviously uh, putting a plan to one side, obviously uh, species are protected by a range of legislation. Obviously, if there's harm to those species um, as a result of works, outside of planning, that's usually a, a police or possibly a statutory agency inquiry, an enforcement issue. Um, for habitats, obviously some of them are protected. Um, be it, you know, countryside hedgerows, got the hedgerow regulations. So, you know, if landowners are removing a hedgerow, uh, they should be going to the local planning authority in the first place, to see whether it's an important hedgerow. Other trees and woodlands uh, protected by tree preservation orders, again, that need consent local planning authority. Uh, the amount of wood you can fell in any one quarter is governed by felling licenses in most countries. Um, and even uh, wildflower meadows, um, if a farmer is intending to intensify his agricultural use of that, it may be just in advance of the planning application, should we say, they should still go to um, their agricultural department in the relevant country and go through an EIA screening opinion process. So. There are um, trolls or consents in place that are required for works to uh, cultural features outside of planning, and those you know, provide that sort of uh, defence before to stop people affecting habitats in the first place prior to planning. So, Sally, got anything else to add to that? No, that, that's fine, thank you. Um, somebody else has also. I said it's helpful to point out that what is assessed is what is consented and that designers often assume that only conditions bind commitments. So I think that's a, a very, very good point from a uh, planner's perspective is, is that what is assessed is what is consented. Um, Ross Baker has asked um, uh, in relation to biodiversity net gain, uh, which is obviously uh, an issue uh, in England um, with the forthcoming environmental bi environment bill um, and thought it be, should be well, just wanted to stress that compensation alone will not be sufficient in the future um, and that that would need to be included in the ecology report so when uh, biodiversity net gain for development uh, is mandated in England or if biodiversity net gain is mandated uh, in England which seems likely um, then compensation alone is not going to be sufficient um, and I would just add to that that SIME is in the process of producing some interim guidance um, for um, uh, ecologists and for planners um, ab around uh, reporting uh, biodiversity net gain in, in relation to planning applications. But it'll only be interim guidance because 
um, we really need to uh, have some experience of it working practice before it can become more, more formal guidance. Lots of local planning authorities with local authority ecologists, which of course we would like to see all local planning authorities having local authority ecologists, uh, are already well, well down the way to uh, working out how they want biodiversity net gain uh, reported. So um, ecologists, ecological consultants should be um, keeping their eye out and, and liaising with the, the relevant local planning authority. Uh, Hilary Ash has asked, how long should mitigation and compensation last? Is it for the life of development? And what happens if future developments want to use compensation land? Oh, that's an interesting question, really. Just touching back on biodiversity net gain, obviously, you know, the aim there is to ensure habitats are provided for up to 30 years. Um, obviously, that's not set in stone yet, so it's only in England. On larger developments, I have seen um, habitat creation management secured for 10, 20 years, and certainly for you know, significant scale developments like you know, quarry restoration. There are opportunities to secure that. Um, I don't think there's clear guidance on the length of time that it secure these things. And um, I am aware uh, in some places that you know, where small strips of land have been provided for great Christian new mitigation, 20 years down the line, they've, they've been lost and swallowed up um, by subsequent development. So unfortunately it has happened, it shouldn't, but it has happened unfortunately. Yeah, it's, there are no hard and fast rules, um, but um, uh, so it is something that needs to be looked at and considered by a planning authority. Certainly coming back to biodiversity net gain in, in England um, in terms of um, the net gain aspect, so that's not mitigation or compensation, it's the gain aspect, um, then that should be secured for uh, 30 years. Um, is um, the way it's going at the moment and there's various work going on in the background to look at how that can be secured. Uh, Ross Wise has asked where translocation of reptiles has been identified as mitigation um, would it be appropriate for a suitable receptor site to be secured through a section 106? Yes I think it would be yes um, obviously there's a, a significant impact on the species there that receptor area may be a separate parcel of land. Um, ideally should be under the applicant's control. Um, and it, it may not happen in all cases, but yeah, I would strongly advise uh, that it is included in 106 agreement. Obviously there is a cost for all parties in producing section 106 agreements, both in terms of the, 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 le the legal time of drawing up these documents um, by the council's legal team reviewed by the developers legal team as well so yeah, it's had to be substantial uh, important to ensure it is uh, one of six agreement close to a condition okay thank you um uh what ecolo ecology information would you expect to be submitted with a ppp application Oops. ppp application not sure what's meant by a ppp application if that if that yeah. attendee would like to clarify yeah it's not um, prior notification which you can have for some agricultural yeah. i was i was hoping you might know alan but i no, no. just ppp oh sally people have popped in the chat all right okay oh so. it stands for planning permission in principle oh planning uh, permission. right yeah, I'm not, I haven't come across a lot of those, unfortunately, so um, I'm probably not the best place to uh, respond fully. But obviously, there is uh, obviously a, perhaps a tension there where, you know, the, the premise, uh, I say, permission in principle, is the legal duties on local planning authorities to consider the Habitats Directive, especially with regard to European protected species. Um, and there was often debate between planners and my ecology colleagues you know whether in considering tree preservation orders applications and listed building consent whether the full impacts on ecology have been considered you know, usually there can be bats both trees and buildings um but we didn't always win should we say <laughs> i think it comes down to 
the view of the, the, the chief planning officer for that authority and um, the, the, their legal advice as well, really. Thank you. Um, it's a question from uh, Sonny Gallagher, who's issues with ecologists publishing all of the raw data from local record centres and submitted reports to the LA. Should the record centre report these repeat offenders to SAIM? Um, well, certainly if uh, you've tried to tackle that problem um, and um, not getting, making any headway, um, then um, that uh, could be referred to, to SAIM. I should say, in terms of SAIM's um, professional conduct inquiry procedures, the purpose is to help our members improve and address any persistent shortcomings, you know, it's not to hang, draw and quarter people and, and necessarily throw, throw them out the Institute. Uh, what we often, uh, the outcome is further training um, or advice as to where they can improve. But if there's a problem that needs to be addressed, then the professional conduct, the um, uh, complaints procedures is certainly a route to go. Um, data should be interpreted um, and, and it's the interpretation that is the key part of, of the report. Um, it might, you know, the data is the raw data is um, uh, is useful and needs to be uh, available if needed, but it's the interpretation of the data that is the, um, the key part of the report. Um, Debbie Alston has asked, should companies list the surveyors who carried out the surveys and wrote the reports? Yes, that's good practice to do so. Um, you should show the um, uh, who was involved in the surveys and um, who wrote the reports, who reviewed the reports as part of the um, uh, quality assurance. Um, and their, their competence to do so. Um, Alison has set, asked if it's typical to complete an ECIA report for a national road scheme, um, if the constraints report and route selection report is still underway, i.e. before the proposed route has been uh, selected. So is it typical to complete an ECIA for national road scheme before the proposed route has been selected? One for you, Alan. Um, I haven't been involved with the national road schemes, um, I think more of a scoping report should be done really if if you're not working to a fixed route that should be the first point really uh, through the potential impacts um, because obviously until you know what the fixed alignment is you don't know what surveys are required yeah. if you can't assess the impacts therefore you can't do the mitigation the compensation so uh, certainly I think First point would be some sort of scoping report. Yeah, agree. Um, Irene Williams has asked whether post development monitoring, as I said, post development monitoring is usually only specified for a few years, but in many cases, such as with woodland planting, the time scale over which success can be assessed is decades. Uh, what can SIM do to advocate a longer time scale, not to mention enforcement, if the compensation is not implemented? Um, I really, we do, uh, have been doing a lot of work um, to try and um, ensure that um, uh, planning authorities understand the need for monitoring and enforcement. Monitoring and enforcement generally in relation to the development planning system is very weak um, and um, it's something we have a lot of uh, discussions with statutory nature conservation bodies with as well. I've got no easy answer to you and I don't think SIGN can um, uh, get involved in enforcement, but certainly um, advocating um, uh, longer term monitoring um, and encouraging enforcement is something that we um, do and, and, and should do more of. Um, but there's no easy answer to that one, I'm afraid. Yeah, there are examples of long term monitoring. Um, yeah. like se second run runway at Manchester Airport, there was um, woodland transification in terms of the ground flora even some of the tree stumps and that has been subject to 10 15 years worth of monitoring now so there are some examples of where yeah. monitoring has gone on yes and there's also i mean i, th I think it's the, the the consistency of monitoring uh, and enforcement and that's a resourcing issue very often um you know some of the bigger schemes actually there's more monitoring and uh, more affecting that, that goes on than all the very small schemes where there's very often very little monitoring that goes on. Um, so, yeah. Um, I'm moving on quite quickly because of time. Um, so, Phil Smith is saying, we're now seeking net gain in biodiversity on all development sites for his following recent adoption of our new local plan. Uh, have you got experience of this from elsewhere? Not sure where you are, Phil, so I'm not sure where elsewhere is. 
and, and do you see net gain as achievable? So Alan, have you seen examples of uh, more local planning authorities seeking net gain uh, across all development? Not across all developments, but I think increasingly where local authorities have got new local plans, certainly in England, where they're obviously um, aligning with the MPPF requirements, then yes, the requirement to provide net gain has, has increased. I'm still interested to see when the uh, government makes it mandatory where it will apply, or what types of applications it will apply to. Um, uh, why left local authority, we'd have a discussion with planners. Uh, in an ideal world, yes, it would be great to get um, net gain on a site which is just, <laughs> but is that fair and realistic to ask for, really? So uh, it'd be interesting where government goes with trying to actually um, narrow down whether it applies to all applications or just you know, certain types. Okay, Ian Nichols, um, Alan is, is saying, when a local authority uses biodiversity offsetting in response to a development proposal, does the developer need to adhere to, so they've used the biodiversity metric, does the developer need to adhere to this or can they suggest their own mitigation measures in response to reducing the calculated compensation fee? Well, I think if they're setting out to use a certain metrics, they need to follow that road, really, um, and adhere to it. Um, obviously, you know, there is a, a drive in England alone to go down version two of the DEFA one. Obviously, there have been previous iterations of that. Warwickshire had a very good one. Um, so, it, well, they, they are going through a process following a metric, so make sure they should follow what's included in that rather than deviate from it obviously there are small things that sometimes aren't always captured by those um and the you know if there is justification for some slight variation that should be justified i think but uh, on the whole yeah, ultimately yeah. it is that the local planning authority that will set the rules so yeah. you need to be talking to your local planning authority um natalie boot uh can you please explain planning condition does a condition mean that planning is accepted as long as this condition is followed in a certain time frame. Um, are there any examples of these conditions in relation to court cases involving EPS licenses? Yes, yeah, so conditions are attached, I should have said, um, I was thinking the main audience here was planners, so rather than non-planners. Uh, yes, yeah, so the conditions are attached to planning permissions when they're issued. So that settle that up really. Um, and there's very good examples of wording of conditions, which is in the British standard, or 2020, I recommend people look at that. Um, and some of those do touch on EPS issues. Thank you. Um, Joanna Dick, as a council biodiversity officer, we get lots of reports with a list of possible mitigation and compensation measures, and then have to go back for confirmation. How can we encourage ecologists to confirm what will be provided in the submitted report, uh, as opposed to what might possibly be provided? Well, I think that's increasing with the drive for net gain enhancements. And yes, what you know, if now written as could it, you know, be more definitive, be written, and um, you know, we'll rely on more dialogue between the client, their ecologists, and other technical specialists to ensure that what is submitted is clear and deliverable. And whether um, that requires, you know. A biodiversity enhancement plan where it's all laid out that's one option or certainly um yeah we need to move away from potentials it has yes, taken time to go back to applicants to say well are you delivering this or not there needs to be you know greater clarity provided for all parties okay we've got three more questions uh, and then we're done so andre teal has said that uh, you say that surveys for eps can only be carried out by licensed surveyors uh, is his understanding that not all surveys for EPS need licensed surveyors, for example, initial site assessments for bats, as long as the species are not disturbed. Surveys need licensed surveyors if a license is required at a later stage. Can you please clarify your understanding of this? Yes, yeah, so I, I was talking in broad terms. Um, yes, yeah, so technically, you wouldn't need to be a licensed bat surveyor to stand outside a barn um, to do a you know emergent survey. However, if you were to do or even do your emergency survey, you really do need to do an inspection internally of that barn. Therefore, you should be licensed to do that because there's a risk that you could go in there 
and disturb a roost. Um, so yeah, there are, yeah. can be circumstances where you're doing a license, but it's best practice to be licensed okay. to avoid any risk. Um, and then we've got, if a report is supporting multiple planning applications at the same site, should the mitigation and enhancements be split out to address the ap impacts of each application separately? Yes, I've, I've had circumstances where I've been one report, one mitigation package, and then we've had to unpick it, shall we say, to divvy up, divide up, and get detailed plans of who's doing what in which part. Yes, they should be clearly laid out. Okay, and then the final question. Uh, do you have any comments about the new building with nature sustainable development standards? I'm not aware of those. Okay, I can, I can pick that one up, Alan. Um, so this relates uh, primarily to uh, green infrastructure and, and biodiversity. Uh, we actually sit on the standards board for building with nature, sign representation on the standards board. Um, we think it's a, a, a positive way to go in terms of um, uh, having standards for um, biodiversity, incorporating biodiversity into uh, building development. It, it kind of complements comp the BREE scheme uh, to some extent, but you know, it, it, is, it is work in progress. And I think the more people that use those standards and provide feedback, the, the, the better they can be um, further developed and, and refined. There's a Building with Nature website if anybody wants to go and uh, look for them, but they're a kind of voluntary standard that um, developers can um, aim to meet with the support of their uh, or their, their various advisors and consultants, but do go and have a look at the Building with Nature uh, website. So that's the end of the questions, and uh, it's also the end of our um, uh, series of webinars. So I just want to take the opportunity to thank you uh, very much, Alan, for everything you've done in supporting and delivering these webinars, and to everybody else for, for joining. Thank you. Thank you all.